All right, you guys, in this lesson, we're going to be discussing a very intense situation that you can find yourself working in in critical care. When your patient is bleeding out rapidly, we need to get them blood as quickly as possible. Time is of the essence, and there are a lot of things going on during this, so I'm going to do my best to review over some of the important things to know. So with that said, let's dive into Massive Transfusion Protocol. All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. My name is Eddie Watson, and as always, my goal is to try to give you guys the confidence to succeed out there in the ICU by taking these complex critical care subjects and really making them easy to understand. I hope that I'm able to do just that for you guys, and if I am, I really invite you to subscribe to the channel down below. When you do, make sure you hit that bell icon, though, that way you never miss out when I release a new lesson. And at the end of this lesson, make sure you head over to icuadvantage.com or follow the link down in the lesson description to take the a quiz on this lesson and test your knowledge as well as be entered into a chance to win weekly gift prizes. All right, so with that said, uh, when you find that your patient is bleeding out, this can often be one of the most stressful situations that you can find yourself in. In some ways, it can almost feel worse than a code. There are many things to be doing and to be aware of. And at the end of the day, if we can't get them blood quick enough, the patient will die. Also, if we can't stop the bleeding, we face the same outcome. Because of these things, this makes a very stressful situation. My goal in this lesson is to cover this information to help you understand all of what's going on. If this is new to you, there is no way that listening to this lesson one time is going to be enough for you. Shoot, I can't even count how many MTPs or massive transfusion protocol situations that I've been a part of, and they all are intense and stressful. Now, I don't mean to scare you guys, but it helps to be prepared. It does get better, but no matter what, it is going to be a high stress situation. Now for these, knowledge and practice are key. Taking the time to learn what is involved is definitely the first step. Reviewing your hospital's protocol is definitely the next step. Know what your facility does in these situations. And then finally, take the time to practice on the equipment that you have. Learn to set up and get running, practice with the actual equipment and the actual tubing that you need to use. I really stress this all the time, uh, especially with new people. You want to practice on and know how to use the equipment that you're going to need to use in high stress situations. So whether this is your rapid transfuser or your defibrillator or whatever, the last thing you want is the added stress of trying to figure out how to work something or troubleshooting something when you just aren't sure what to do. So this is really the key point here. So with that out of the way, let's actually talk about what is massive transfusion. So there is technically a definition out there that if you give 10 units of blood over 24 hours that this is considered massive transfusion. While this is great for retrospectively looking back, it really doesn't help us in the moment. I did see another suggestion that if you're giving anywhere from 3 to 5 units within an hour that we would also consider this a massive transfusion. And while this certainly is better, we still need to look at a way to define this a little bit better. At the core of the decision of whether to activate MTP is the understanding that if the patient needs blood, that time matters. If they are massively bleeding out, they need a lot of blood immediately. There's no exact science to always getting this right, but if we consider the clinical picture and the presence of known bleeding, it is better to activate and get the blood coming. Now, if we have labs, then great, but in some situations or traumas or sudden changes in our patients, we're probably just not going to have labs to really tell us anything yet. If we do have those labs, though, we want to be looking at our hemoglobin. Is it very low? Have we seen a massive drop on that? Also look at our lactic acid, and is this elevated and in indicating that we have decreased or inadequate perfusion for our patient? We can also use something like the shock index, which is a good tool sometimes too. Basically here we're taking the heart rate divided by the systolic blood pressure, and if it's greater than 1.0 in an active bleed, then this would be an indication for massive transfusion protocol. And then any obvious mass exsanguination is another determining factor here. So your bleeding traumas, your OB bleeds, epitaxis, ruptured varices, chest tubes that are dumping out, all of these things would be obvious indications that your patient needs a lot of blood now. And then remember that we're dealing with hemorrhagic shock, which is essentially hypovolemic shock. The signs and symptoms here are going to be things that we're going to want to be looking out for. I do already have a really great lesson that I did on this, so if you haven't watched that already, I am going to link to that up above here. 
But essentially, we're wanting to take the overall clinical picture, maybe using some of these tools that are available to us, and then make a determination on whether or not we think this patient is going to need large volumes of fluid. If so, we need to get that going. And so that kind of segues nicely into the next thing that I want to talk about, which is really going to be our activation of the massive transfusion protocol. So MTP is how we often refer to this. And again, I can't stress this enough, but remember that time is of the essence here. So first and foremost, when this decision has been made, you're going to need to immediately call the blood bank and alert them to activating MTP. Ultimately, they're going to need an order for this, but let them know first so they can get started and then get the order in immediately after that. Now, do keep in mind, though, that this is going to activate a truly massive amount of blood coming your way. And in my facility, that this is going to continue to happen until you tell them to stop. So be aware of this and make sure that you are calling to discontinue as soon as you know that that's the situation. Now, for MTP, this is truly going to require all hands on deck. So if you need to, absolutely call a code. Make sure you designate someone whose sole job it is to run blood. So send them down to blood bank immediately and wait for that first disbursement. As soon as it's available, you want to have somebody there that can grab it and immediately bring it up to you. Now, the next couple of things really need to be done as quickly as possible. The first of these is to have good IV access. Now, to appropriately transfuse here, you're going to need large bore access. So at least an 18 gauge, but preferably a 16 gauge or larger. And IVs do work great for this. You do want to make sure, though, that you do have them in the AC. And once you do begin transfusing, you want to make sure that you're not using a J-loop with a pressure cap on there because that's going to limit your flow. You want to attach this directly to the hub of the IV. Now, central large bore access can also be used. Regular central lines, though, really are not going to work here. The lumens are too small, they're too long, and you're just not going to get adequate flow. If your patient has an HD line, these are actually fantastic for this. You do want to make sure you know your facility's practice on whether they're packed with heparin and citrate, and if so, make sure that you are withdrawing that before you begin here. You can also use something like a MAC catheter or a cordis. In these cases where it's multi-lumen, you want to make sure that you're identifying and using the largest lumen possible. Introducers are another option. They can be good, but they might not always be the best bet. But again, if that's all that we have, they can definitely be useful in this situation. And then another point to remember here is that we still want to try and maintain sterility and aseptic technique. The problem is in exsanguinating patients though, this might not always be possible. Obviously our first and most important thing is getting the patient blood and saving their life. Now, one thing to keep in mind that when we're placing quote unquote dirty lines to use to transfuse them, that it might not be a bad idea to change out any lines that were placed emergently 24 hours later if that's possible. So now we've got our good IV access. The next thing that we want to really focus on is preparing the rapid transfuser. So hopefully you have a rapid transfuser available to you. The Belmont or the level one, these are the common ones and they're actually really fantastic, both of them. You want to get it in the room, get it turned on and primed with normal saline and attached to good access. Essentially, we want to be able to start the blood as soon as it arrives and be ready to go. Now for the rapid transfuser, you're going to want to have at least one person that's dedicated just to running the rapid transfuser. With good access of 14 gauge or bigger, a unit of blood can actually be transfused in a minute or less even. You do also want to double check and make sure that your heating element is on and functional. So on the level one, you want to check your water level. They are designed to heat the blood to 37 degrees before it hits the patient. I am going to explain the importance of this in a few minutes here though. Another thing is also to make sure that all your connections are secure. I personally make a habit to manually check the tightness on each of the connection points. In the past, I have had them not be well secured before. Let me tell you, it's not pretty. Now, if you don't have a rapid transfuser or you don't have it immediately available to you, then you want to prepare some IV tubing that you can hand pump in and use a pressure bag on. If it's all you got, it definitely is better than nothing, but it's not fun when you're doing this for multiple units. And so if you can, and this is a big if, before you get started, get a full set of labs drawn and sent off. Now, if the patient is not blood typed already, after a massive transfusion, that this may not be possible or even accurate. Again, though, I cannot stress enough, do not delay giving the blood. Typically, though, you should have plenty of time to be able to do this before the first units even come up to you. And then a final point, too, is that if the patient's not already, then most likely they're going to need to be intubated, especially if you're going to be doing some sort of endoscopic attempt at repairing the bleed that's going on. That said, though, hemodynamics are often going to be compromised in these patients, and if our patients are not properly resuscitated, then the induction could actually lead to cardiovascular collapse. So 
As a result, it might be necessary to do a round of MTP before we actually do the intubation. All right, so I keep talking about MTP, but what does that actually mean or what does that compose of? So let's talk about the different components of our MTP. So the main components to any MTP is obviously going to be the blood products. So we do want to avoid crystalloids for these patients as we do run the risk of diluting our clotting factors as well as diluting our oxygen carrying capacity, which is already going to be diminished. Blood is what the bleeding patient needs. Now, MTP can vary slightly from facility to facility, but the same basic principles apply. So we have one round of our NTP, and this is going to include the following. Six units of PRBCs. Typically, this is going to be O negative or potentially O positive blood if their blood type is not known. We're also going to see six units of FFP. And here again, we're going to be using AB positive if the blood type is unknown. And then we're also going to have one unit, so a six pack of platelets. And again, remember that we do not want to run these through the rapid transfuser or on a pump. We want to let these hang into the patient. So our goal here is we're wanting to have a 1 to 1 to 1 ratio. Now, this doesn't mean that you need to give one unit of PRBCs and then follow that with one unit of FFP and then give one sixth of the platelets that you have. What our goal is, is to have a balanced approach. So again, this is going to be going very quickly. So if we're giving several units of PRBCs and then following it up with several units of FFP, all while the platelets are going in, you're going to be just fine. At the end of the day, as long as you maintain this ratio, that's what we're really looking for. The whole point of this is to try to prevent any further coagulopathies and really to keep the patient neutral with the RBCs, the volume, clotting factors, and platelets that they have. Now, depending on your facility, you could also see cryoprecipitate be a part of your MTP protocol. And so here you might also be giving the cryo with every round as well. And then on top of these components here, that there could potentially be some other things that are included as a part of this protocol. A lot of it surrounding our coagulopathies, which I am going to talk about in just a minute and a little bit more in depth here. So now the blood bank is going to prepare all of this together and then send this up as one whole package. The one exception to this is going to be the very first round. So because FFP needs to be thawed, you're often just going to get the RBCs first. Then once it's ready, they're going to follow that up with the FFP and platelets. After this first round, then the blood bank should be on point with sending the whole package together thereafter. And then with this, it's really important that you know your facility's policy on the administration here. You are still going to need to check the blood against the slip in the patient. That's going to be vital. But as far as your vitals recording and the charting is really going to be dependent on your facility. At a minimum, a record of how many of each product were given as well as the total volume. Now from here, I do want to talk real quickly on source control. Essentially, we're going to need to stop the bleeding. Now, this may seem pretty obvious, but it must be said. If the bleeding doesn't stop, we're just wasting blood products at this point and the result is our patient will not make it. It's probably already known what the cause is in most cases, although for traumas, this really may not be apparent at first. Once the cause is determined, then we absolutely need to try and fix it. So for traumas, this could be temporizing measures such as in the trauma bay using clamps, reboa, tourniquets, pressure, etc. before they get off to the OR. For our bleeding OB and post-op patients, this is often going to require, if you can, a trip to the OR or perhaps even bedside surgery. So here be thinking the chest re-exploration in the CVICU. Then for GI bleeds, this is going to require emergent endoscopic procedure. So with all of this, make sure that the room is prepared and gather any necessary supplies that you're going to need to assist. Hopefully the room has already been cleared with everything that's going on, but do make sure that the room is cleared of any unnecessary clutter, chairs, carts that aren't needed, tables that aren't needed, etc. Things like tables and carts, they can definitely be right outside the room and brought in or someone can bring them in whenever they're needed. There's going to be a bunch of people in the room, especially if you're doing bedside OR, and so we're going to need to have things as decluttered as we possibly can. All right, so we've got MTB activated, things are going. We do also need to talk about those some concepts of coagulopathies. There's a couple things that we need to be on the lookout for and really to try and prevent with the massively exsanguinating patient that can really work against us and make it harder to stop that bleeding. So the first of these is going to be the dilution of clotting factors. So we do try to avoid this with that balanced ratio, that one to one to one, but by the time we get that going, we may already be behind with this patient. So big things to keep an eye on 
here are our platelets and our fibrinogen. So do consider checking fibrinogen and giving cryo if it's not already a part of that protocol. Other things like transagnemic acid may also be beneficial in things like OB and trauma patients and potentially other situations as well. There definitely are some MTP protocols that do have this worked into it. So the next thing to be concerned about with coagulopathies is going to be hypothermia. So blood products are cold, and even large volumes of room temperature fluid can have a significant impact on our patient's core temperature. Massive transfusion then can obviously potentially lead to hypothermia, and the problem is that hypothermia is going to impair the clotting, and thus it's very important that we are monitoring a temperature, preferably when we want to have a core temperature. Now, the rapid transfusers, the Belmont and the Level 1, that they can really help to try and prevent this with warming that blood, but we do also want to consider the use of warming blankets early on. And then once your patient is intubated, or if they already are, and we do have control over the warming of the gas, going to the patient, we also want to be doing this as well. All right, the next thing to also be thinking about is going to be our patient's calcium. So hypocalcemia is definitely another concern with our MTP. And in fact, patients in the ICU often face low levels to begin with, but the main factor here is going to be the citrate that's in the blood products to try and prevent clotting. So again, as a reminder, citrate binds and inactivates our calcium. And especially when giving multiple units, that this is going to diminish the calcium available to our patient. Now, calcium plays a very important role in activating platelets and several of our clotting factors. Thus, if we bind up our patient's calcium, we're impairing an important part of the clotting cascade and thus he hemostasis. Not good as I previously mentioned. Now moderate hypercalcemia is acceptable and tolerated well and thus we're often going to favor a more liberal approach to our calcium administration. Having bedside monitoring of the calcium level with something like an ISTAT is really going to help to guide our administration here. But after each round of MTP, we probably want to consider the use and potentially giving the patient like one gram of IV calcium chloride or three grams of calcium gluconate. And then finally, the last thing to be thinking about when it comes to our coagulation or coagulopathies is going to be acidosis. So acidosis here, and even mild acidosis, so like less than 7.20, can have an impact on the clotting cascade. So we do want to manage our patient's acidosis in our typical ways that we would. And for most of our patients, we do want to attempt to keep that pH at or above 7.2. Now, this can be through increasing minute volume to try and compensate for any metabolic acidosis. The citrate in the blood is actually alkalotic and may potentially help us here, as well as sodium bicarb may be warranted in some situations as well. And then on top of that, in addition to everything else that's going on, we do also want to treat any of the underlying causes of acidosis that you can think of. Hopefully, if there's a lactic acidosis going on because of decreased perfusion, hopefully now with the added volume and oxygen carrying capacity that we should be correcting that part. All right, so that was kind of my review of our massive transfusion protocol. There's definitely a lot that's going on. It's a lot to kind of take in, and especially when you are first a part of this, it's going to seem quite overwhelming. So it does help to kind of be prepared. Like I said, know your policy, know your protocol, know your equipment. All of that is definitely going to help you in these situations. You're going to have a great team around you, everybody working together, just like we do in the codes. It's going to be stressful, but if everybody works together, we can definitely give the best possible hope for that patient in that moment. So I really hope that I was able to cover this subject and cover some of the key important points for you guys. If I did and you liked the lesson, then please do leave me a like down below. I really appreciate it and it really goes a long way to help support this channel. As well as leave me a comment, let me know what you thought of the lesson. I love reading them and trying to respond to just about everybody. Also share this lesson with anybody else you think might find this lesson useful as well. Do subscribe to the channel down below if you haven't already, and a special shout out to the awesome YouTube and Patreon members out there. The continued support that you provide this channel from month to month really means the world to me and will continue to allow me to grow and do bigger and better things with this channel. For the rest of you guys, if you'd be interested in seeing how you could show support, then you can check out the YouTube membership down below or head on over to Patreon and check out some of the additional perks that you guys get for doing just that. You can also support this channel by following some of the links down in the lesson description below. Make sure you stay Stay tuned for the next lesson that I release in this series. Otherwise, check out a couple really awesome lessons I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.